Professor Adler, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Why don't we start off with your background? You know, where are you coming from, the arc of your career so far, and what you're doing now? Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, grew up just outside Detroit. Um, attended the University of Michigan, which is where I, I think I got my interest in political science. Uh, the politics had always been a conversation in our house growing up. Uh, and uh, dabbled in a few courses there, and, and um, in particular, a, a, a course, my, my first political science course was with a Professor Michael Cohen, who had been one of the people who was sort of early in introducing the uh, sort of game theory into um, political science. And it was really a very different kind of introductory course. Got me hooked. Uh, majored in it when I was at Michigan. Um, went to Washington once while I was an undergraduate and really got an interest in what was happening on the Hill. And uh, graduated uh, uh, in December of my senior year because I had a fellowship to go to Washington again. And at the time I was, um, we're talking about the late 1980s, um, the Cold War was still going on. I was interested in um, arms control issues, which was very hot topic. But as I spent the next six months working in Washington and on and off the Hill all the time, um, really became fascinated with the inner workings of Congress and knew I was going on to do a PhD um, in political science. So once I left Washington, moved to New York uh, to do my PhD at Columbia, I was already beginning to think maybe I was more interested in American politics than what I had thought I was going to do, do it for my PhD, which was international relations. Um, the Cold War was winding down. Um, the Soviet Union was coming to an end as I was beginning my doctoral work. And I was actually watching people who were finishing their doctorates um, studying the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden the, the topic that they had studied for, for years and years was gone. Um, and I had determined that I was just much more interested in what was happening in American politics, particularly Congress. So shifted to that, um, had some great, mentors at Columbia who were um, had the time and the inclination to foster that interest and work with me and um, was very happy um, doing that kind of work. Finished at Columbia, uh, came to Colorado, which I really spent more or less all of my career after that, um, studying and teaching Congress in particular and American politics and um, elections and uh, became um, um, really interested in the in the various changes of Congress over the last quarter century since I've been here at, at the University of Colorado. So my career has kind of followed what's been going on on the Hill, um, the reform movements and, and how Congress has changed. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, got a little more interested in how the work, how a different institution operates, which is um, the institution of higher education, in particular my institution, the University of Colorado. So um, uh, about two and a half years ago, became dean of the graduate school. So um, my my work has shifted a little bit. I still do my research, but um, now I'm kind of focused on the. Uh, being part of the leadership here at the University of Colorado and helping uh, our current and future graduate students um, obtain their degrees and go on to fruitful careers. So that's where I am now, still doing uh, some work on Congress, um, still involved with congressional reforms, but um, most of my day-to-day -day is, is working on the graduate school here at, at CU. Uh, 
So when we talk about your research, you know, obviously you you mentioned your shift from international relations to something more domestic, Congress in particular. What are the broad areas of your work, uh, if you look at it coming from the high level, what are the main thrusts of your research? Um, congressional reforms is where I got my start. And that, and in a lot of ways, that was um, an outgrowth of what was happening in Washington at the time. So um, the 103rd Congress, the mid 1990s, uh, was the Democratic Congress that began um, considering it was part of that, the, the um, once a generation uh, uh, consideration of how to restructure the institutions of the Democrats sort of took up, uh, along with uh, Republican members, took up this self-reflection on how could they make the institution operate better. Um, and then what ended up happening, the, the Gingrich revolution, the Republicans take over and they actually institute a whole bunch of reforms. And this was all occurring as I was working on my dissertation. So that's where that focus came from. I was really interested in melding what was going on in, in political science, in the study of Congress, what was called at the time new institutionalism um, with what was happening on the Hill. And there were a number of, I wasn't the only one, there were a number of scholars of that generation of, um, came in, coming out of graduate school at the same time who were doing very, very similar work. Um, some of us focused a little more on parties. I focused a little bit more on um, committees and the linkage to constituencies. Um, but I've always been really fascinated by reforms, congressional committees, um, how the institution itself performs in general, the patterns of lawmaking, um, and mostly in the kind of contemporary era, so post-World War II, uh, um, that's been the sort of main thrust of a lot of my work, um, the bigger projects that I've taken on, the data collection that I've done. And so that, along with a few other things uh, related to this, um, a little bit on elections, a little bit on presidency, um, the main, uh, focus of the work has been on the institution it, itself, committees in particular, and um, how that structures the performance and the policy making of Congress. Well, let's jump into, I think it was your first book, um, Why Reforms Fail, which is right in the wheelhouse of what you just mentioned. So, you know, obviously you've thought a lot about these past reforms, and we've talked to Eric Schickler in the past, who's also put, to, put forth a kind of theory of of, you know, of, of multi-directional influences on uh, what happens when, when reform takes place. You know, talk to us about, you know, what kind of questions were you asking when you set out to do that book and, and what did you find? Uh, what, if anything, did you find and why reforms fail or, you know, why they don't happen at all? Um, yeah, so, so the, the, that, that project was, um, a, again, it came out of what was happening on the Hill at the time. And I was beginning to see the linkages between the reform movement um, in the, in the mid-1990s, what had occurred um, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and the prior reform to that, which was um, directly after World War II, late 1940s. Um, so you're kind of seeing this pattern over time, this, this cycles of reform. And um, one of the things that was going on in political science at that time, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, was this um, new interest in the institutions of Congress, the structures of Congress, the rules, um, the things that shaped how decisions were being made. And some of that work, um, was being driven by the introduction of, of game theory and, and microeconomics into the study of this decision-making body, um, which, part, which was part of the education that a lot of folks in my generation, Eric Schickler, as you pointed out, for example, um, were, who was a student of David Mayhew's at Yale, uh, was kind of getting that uh, that same education at, at the same time. Um, and 
there were folks who were focusing on the growth of parties because that was when we were starting to see a, a stronger influence of the formal party structures in Congress on lawmakers, um, on the actions of lawmakers, the positions that they were holding in the institution, um, how that was related to elections, both elections, individual members elections, and the, the outcome of elections for, of course, majorities in both chambers. Um, so there was a lot of growth in how were parties shaping the performance and the outcomes in Congress. Um, at the same time, there was work going on that was uh, calling some into question some of that, uh, most prominently, of course, the work of Keith Crable and this notion that you have this, this larger body um, that needs to make decisions uh, and needs information in order to do that. So how do you maximize the organization of the institution in order to have, uh, have the adequate information needed to make decisions? Um, I was a little more attached to the notion that, well, members are really very closely tied to their constituencies. And in particular, I was very interested in what was happening in committees. And, it, and to me, I, I was seeing that a lot of the activities of committees, and of course, the things that they were, the, the legislation that they were producing was still really very much motivated by um, lawmakers reelection imperative and um, how they could represent their constituencies in Congress, specifically in committees. And I, of course, this was nothing new. This was the work that had been going on for years and years prior to the, the um, this, these notions of the importance of information and the importance of party parties, David Mayhew, um, Mo Fiorina, uh, and a lot of the scholars of that prior generation were talking about how the reelection motivation of members of Congress was shaping their decisions, not just their decisions on what legislation they would support, but actually how they would shape the institution. So I was trying to bring back in um, that constituency perspective into reforms, into the discussion about reforms. And as I said, those three different reform eras, 1940s, 1970s in general, and, and, and the 1990s. Um, and so that's what was going on in that book was um, showing how the importance of committees was to the composition, uh, I, I'm sorry, the importance of constituencies were to the composition of committees. So I did a kind of study of that, um, some work uh, with John Lopinski and myself, um, and then eventually uh, expanded work that came in, in that book. Uh, and then also showing that in a lot of ways, getting back to the title, why congressional reforms fail, why those kinds of reforms were failing was often being driven by the uncertainty that changes to the committee structure would cause for lawmakers and the, those ties to their constituencies. Because for, for generations, they had seen the committee system as a way to demonstrate to their important constituencies at home, of, of course, economic constituencies, but they, they went beyond that as well, geographic, social constituencies, um, that they were able to work on the issues that are important to, to their constituents. And the committee system was critical to that. It's still the case today, um, but I was trying to show how the approach toward that members took toward uh, committee reforms was often shaped by where they were coming from with respect to representing their constituencies. And I still think that um, in a lot of respects that's true today, um, that, that members become very reluctant to um, 
having certain kinds of reforms because of the uncertainty that it causes uh, for their reelection and their constituency um, relationship. Um, but other factors now have bled in uh, even more. And I think, of course, we can't ignore what's happening in the parties. But that was the motivation of that, that book and the findings. It would seem that what you just mentioned about this constituency issue would play out, I mean, just intuitively, it sounds more like a jurisdiction of the committees, yeah. you know, in terms of chopping up their, 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 uh, their territories, right? Uh, rather than something that would be across all committees like rule changes or power of the chairman versus the ranking member, that kind of thing. Is that, were you looking mainly at jurisdiction and then that's where you could see those effects? Uh, jurisdiction is probably the most prominent and that in all of those eras, um, that was often what was on the table was um, sort of rearranging the jurisdictions a, uh, a little bit or a lot. Um, and so often they're protecting constituencies, uh, uh, sorry, protecting jurisdictions because of their constituencies. They want to lose control of issues of, of course that are critical to the voters back home. It wasn't exclusively that, and there were some instances where um, committees would be empowered more, or um, even my uh, backbenchers and minority party members would be empowered more, and that and that was part of it. But yes, no question, um, uh, a large part of that would be the rearranging of of jurisdictional um, boundaries and. And certainly, you know, lawmakers didn't wanted to defend those, um, even even in the face of sometimes pretty good evidence that that the issues had evolved over time, and perhaps um, these two issues belong better together in this committee than they did in a different committee. So, um, no no question. Um, jurisdictions were a major, major part of each of those reform areas. What other parts of the reform did you look at besides those types of jurisdictional issues? You know, did you look at you know, rules inside committee uh, or the size of the membership of the committee? I mean, I would think that if you're thinking about re-election, maybe just increase the, the membership of each committee so everybody gets a everybody gets a, some candy um, in exchange for something else. So I'm curious, you know, whether you first of all looked at other kinds of questions like rules uh, or chairman control and maybe even member si the number the number of members allocated to committees um, all of those were on the table uh, of course you know um, certainly expanding the size of committees is a way to give everyone a um, an opportunity to, to play in all the different um, potential places where uh, uh, committees where there are issues that might touch their constituencies. But on the other hand, it dilutes your own influence on the committees that you're on because um, instead of being one of 25 or one of 40, you're, you might be one of um, 60 or 80, right? And, and, then, and, and of course, that causes its own problems in terms of coordination. And, and um, it's something that, that's very much come up in the, in the latest round of our consideration of reforms in Congress uh, today. Um, there were a number of other things that were happening. Uh, 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 the influence of specific committees, appropriations, for example, or the Rules Committee in the House, um, and what place that those committees held in determining um, things like budgets, right? And we ended up um, in the 1970s with the creation of a new committee like the Budget Committee um, that would shape how Congress did one of its most important things, which is, of course, decide how money is spent, um, both at the macro level um, with the Budget Committee and the, the, the sort of more narrow program level at the appropriation, for the Appropriations Committee. But shaping who decides what, who gets on what committees, that was a big change that occurred in the 1970s. And then again in the 1990s, um, whether or not uh, the parties would have a policy committee or a committee that determines what, what would be the agenda of the party, that was something that was on the table in the 1940s. Um, so there's a, there were a lot of different reforms that were often being tossed around or considered 
uh, at various times. Um, and there often was just resistance to any kind of change because that would upend um, not just the existing structure, but, in, but often, particularly, it would undermine the power of leadership. And of course, you know, leaders are going to put a lot of resistance to this. Uh, in the 1970s, it, it was specifically the leadership of the committees themselves. So if you were going to devolve some power down to subcommittees, to um, lower ranked or backbenchers, lower ranked members, uh, minor giving some staff to minority members, that was going to pull power away from the committee chairs. And of course, the committee chairs were not going to like that at all. And committee chairs were, at that time, had a tremendous amount of authority to decide um, not just what bills would go through their committees at all, but who would be able to influence the, the trajectory of those bills. Um, there, were, there were committees that would have subcommittees, but the subcommittees would have no jurisdictions themselves. They, they, and in fact, in some committees, they would just be numbered. And the committee chair could simply decide um, which one of those subcommittees would consider a bill. Uh, so they were very, very resistant to any kinds of reforms that would chip away at their um, seemingly limitless power on the committee to decide um, the direction of legislation. And so you would get a lot of resistance from, from, the, from those kinds of leaders. Um, and then of course we saw in the 1990s a centralization of power uh, in the party leadership. And of course, again, pulling away authority from committees in general, not just the, the committee chairs, but committees in general and centralizing a lot of authority. And that's been, and we've seen that go even further in, in the, in the last uh, decade or so. So um, yeah, a, a wide array of reforms, uh, not just jurisdictions, jurisdictions were a big part of it. And, and often um, really the thing that would um, be the nail in the coffin on, reform, on certain reforms. Um, so that comes up again in the most recent discussion about, about congressional reforms today. Uh, whether or not to, to look at jurisdictions. Right, if, if the committees are weak as they are now, according to many, then it might be a good time to, to change it all, uh, to make it more rational. Um, um, yes, and, th and that is actually um, one of the very important discussions that's happening in the current um, consideration of reforms, the, the, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress uh, Derek Kilmer's committee, um, which is generally, which is just a House committee, um, and it's uh, amongst many reforms that it's considering right now is how do you specifically um, involve members more in the lawmaking process, um, so um, give them more to do on the Hill, and. <laughs> So that they're not doing other things and they're not um, engaging in mischief off of uh, outside of the lawmaking process, but are spending more time doing what Congress needs to do, which of course is to govern, to make laws. Um, and so the question is, how do you do that? As you said, um, in a body where um, where uh, committees are not really the central focus of lawmaking anymore, that so much is being done uh, uh, centralized in, in party leadership and seemingly little is being done in the traditional place where much of the consideration of new legislation was, which was the committees. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the question is, do committees become a place to try and reinvigorate uh, uh, and, and engage lawmakers again in the policymaking process? And, and I, I, I was an advocate of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a believer that the committees, that perhaps it's going back to committees 
as the locus of decision making on, on legislation as a way to not just um, help Congress uh, with respect to the executive branch and, and give it again, bo boost its position um, versus the, the presidency and, and um, the agencies and, and the, the departments and also give a place for individual lawmakers to be engaged in the process. So yeah, I, I'm a believer that I'm, I'm I'm still a believer in committees and their central role in in what Congress does. All right. Well, let's move on to the I guess your uh, another one of your books, which is the politics of problem solving. Maybe you can talk more about what what kind of questions that book was addressing and and that issue, what it means, and uh, what what did you find? Sure. So um, let's see where where did that come from. Um, as I was finishing the uh, Why Congressional Reforms Fail, uh, I, I, of course, was getting interested in the, the sorry, not that, um, uh, in the progress of bills. Um, and uh, uh, the question was, what bills make it through committees? Because as we know, you know, only a fraction of the bills that are introduced and get referred to committees actually get considered and um, uh, uh, and sent through the committee system and reported on to um, uh, reported on to the, the the chamber. So I began to get interested in tracking bills, and that's how uh, John Wilkerson and I started our um, project where we really wanted to just ba basically track every bill that was introduced in Congress. And we somehow were able to discern that we could probably do this going back to basically the, the, the beginning of the modern Congress, uh, the late 1940s. Um, a little, uh, it was a little harder than we initially realized. Um, uh, because some of the bills, basically those from about the 1970s on, were um, at least summaries and and a um, a uh, some information about their progress, who introduced them, who sponsored them, um, what committee they went through, and what their final disposition was was available electronically, but that was not the case for everything prior to that. So going back to the 1940s. So we ended up having to scan uh, back, you know, and this was quite a number of years ago, um, the details on all of those bills, but we were able to do it. Um, and one of the things that we realized as we were looking at the patterns of legislation when bills were getting introduced, when they were passing through committees, was that there what seemed to be a, an ebb and flow uh, of issue areas over time. So what we thought we were beginning to do, which was to study um, the introduction um, and the patterns of these bills, and whether or not there were things that we could discern were affecting this um, unified and divided government or um, certain uh, uh, patterns of membership on committees or um, the issues that were important to the public as, as a whole, it, it, became, we, it became very clear to us that that's not what we were seeing in the, in, in the data. And what we were seeing was that um, there, there were these expiring authorizations that would come up for renewal. There were some big ones, of course, that we hear about, or we used to hear about all the time, the farm bill, the highway bill, uh, of course, annually, the um, defense uh, authorization. Um, um, but there were many, many versions of these sort of three, four, five-year authorizations, they'd expire, they'd come up for renewal. And of course, that was explaining what was going on in the committees because they had to deal with these expired authorizations. Um, 
And that's how we started getting into what was what eventually became this book, which was that we were seeing that um, the agenda of Congress, the agenda of committees, was very much shaped by the work that had gone on in the previous Congress, and that they had um, enacted a um, limited time or a short-term authorization of a few years that enabled um, the appropriations, what would be the appropriations for the subsequent years within, the, within a certain realm of policy or for a specific government agency or um, department. And often, despite the fact that there might have been something going on external to Congress and an urgency that a, an issue be dealt with, have perhaps in education or in transportation or in um, uh, some, some other realm of, of public interest, but it would be put off until it would be put off until um, the um, until the reauthorization expired, and then of course they would deal with it at that time. Um, so what we would see with respect to um, how Congress would shape its schedule of, of work was through um, these expiring authorizations. So there was some degree of predictability and also a, a way in which um, you would have interests outside of Congress. Of course, you'd have plenty of uh, um, economic interests, industries, uh, lobbyists from particular areas uh, who work all over Washington. And they would know that um, in, in two years, the transportation, the, the big highway bill would come up. And that's when the transportation committees and both chambers would be focused on those issues. So that's when they would come to them with the, with the kinds of um, the details on the legislation that they would like to see. And it actually turns out that it was a good way to sort of shape the work that Congress would do. And it also helped committees not have to deal with the same issues over and over and over again each year. <clears throat> so we were trying to explore in that book the ways in which we could see the agendas of Congress being shaped by these patterns of, uh, of expirations and, and reauthorizations, renewals. Um, and it was also a way that Congress would revisit and update the work of government on a, on a, on a fairly regular basis. Of course, as the book was coming out, which is now, I guess, 10 years old, um, we were beginning to see um, the waning of reauthorizations and Congress was having more and more trouble renewing those expiring authorizations and would often have to renew things on continuing resolutions or through the appropriations process in general. And, um, in some instances, lawmakers didn't even want to bring up the reauthorization for consideration because they of a fear, depending on what the issue was, that they just simply couldn't get a renewal or a reauthorization of certain programs because they 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 were just a third rail. They were they were hard to get agreement on again, and so we've seen more and more that the reauthorizations, that programs would exist without the reauthorization being updated. And that's very much to the detriment of, of the way government operates, um, which is you're, you're disengaging on the one hand, internal to Congress, you're disengaging the experts on those committees um, because they're not spending the time renewing the legislation, talking to um, the, the relevant folks in the agencies, talking to the outside interests, figuring out what, where that agency, agent, agency should be going, um, 
And so you're not able to give it the direction that it needs. And you're simply just updating it, uh, uh, just simply renewing it through the appropriations process. And I think that that very much is to the detriment of what Congress is supposed to be doing, which is governing and overseeing these programs. Yeah, so obviously there's some people who think that there's no need for an authorization and an appropriation step, just have the appropriation step. Uh, sounds like you're of the camp that values the authorizations. Um, Abs yeah, absolutely. I, there's a reason the two should be separated. Um, the decision-making over, over the content of the legislation, the enabling legislation, and then how much money we're going to spend, those should be separate decisions. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, it's funny uh, when I when I say this, I think about my my current job, right? As um, as a as an administrator at a university, and we very much separate out those decisions as well, knowing full well that the decision about what we want to engage in as a university and how much money we're going to spend on that are really very very closely tied um, decisions. Well, the same is true in Congress, right? And and there are folks whose expertise is separated. And, and I think that we should um, very much keep um, a division between the decisions about what are our priorities on a legislative level? How should those, um, how should those agencies be functioning and those programs be performing is a different decision then how much money we're going to spend on that, and 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 that takes the two take into account different factors, and I think we're doing a disservice. Getting back to your your point a moment ago, that we're doing a disservice when we only have the appropriations, uh, the appropriators making these decisions about really just the purse strings without really any important. Um, insight into what's going on on a on on a on the specific level of the agency the performance of the programs should the programs continue what kinds of changes need to be made um, those are not the kind of details that we normally attribute to appropriators um, and so yeah i'm very much a believer that we should separate out the authorizations and the appropriations well, one of the big differences is that the Authorizations is more of a binary decision kind. Of, it's a binary type of decision. This exists or it doesn't, right? Um, and appropriations is a typically a numerical decision. How much? And they would lend themselves towards different processes. Now, the Congress may be deciding them in the same way, but they don't necessarily have to be decided in that same mechanism. Um, that's right. That's right. Um, I think I think you're you're very correct in what in, you know. Should the programs exist? How should they be structured? Um, how should Congress itself be engaged in the process of overseeing those programs, reviewing them? Um, what kind of input do they need from the public in, as a whole? Uh, should we be redesigning the programs or as you might be suggesting, eliminating the programs? They're not performing the duty that, that they um, once did or their necessity no longer exists, which we uh, occasionally see, um, is all a different decision than how much money do we have to spend on this right now? Um, which, as, as I think you were suggesting a moment ago, that needs to be taken in the context of our overall budget. And what does the economy look like? And what is our budget likely to look like next year? Um, that's a different set of decisions. So yes, we do need to separate the two. Um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very much a believer that the expertise is a really a different kind of expertise as well. So maybe you can talk a little bit about your notion of congressional performance, because you know, all the things we've talked about ultimately are trying to improve the performance of Congress, whether, you know, whether it's reform or you know, we're talking about authorizations. You know, that's a if they don't authorize, don't reauthorize, they don't pass the bill, that, that, that would imply a, a lack of performance by Congress as an institution. So can you talk about the framework you're using to think about con Congress as an institution, and its performance? What, what would be good performance? What would be worse performance? How would you measure it? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, 
And it's one that we think about all the time these days. Um, you know, uh, is Congress really carrying out its responsibilities, its duties as we traditionally think of them? Um, is it governing? Is it acting as a counterweight to the executive branch? Um, is it creating the, uh, the big legislation that we traditionally think of as the role of, of the legislative branch? Um, and so at various points in my career and, and, and plenty of other congressional scholars, we've kind of uh, addressed this question a little bit, you know, uh, uh, and it became a little bit of a cottage industry in the field of congressional studies. How do we measure the performance of Congress? Um, you know, and for a long time, we were just looking at, at the production of legislation or in, in a slightly more um, nuanced form, the production of important legislation. And so we spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out how, well, how do you, how do you distinguish um, laws in terms of their importance or in terms of their impact? And we, we came up with different ways to examine that. We were often, they were um, sort of a, 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 a post hoc uh, examination of, well, what did we think of the legislation once it was produced or its impact or how much, how much media attention did it garner um, over the long run or, or immediately when it was passed? Um, and I don't think those were bad measures at all, really, um, because it, and when you step back and you looked at, well, how, what pieces of legislation did these measures um, tell us were, were the most important? They, they were pretty reasonable, right? I mean, by any good measure, things like the Civil Rights Act was a monumental piece of legislation, right? And, um, and, and, and so, you know, it ranks up there in the top two or three most important pieces of legislation. And that, that's completely reasonable. It was transformative for the country. Um, uh, we're not seeing uh, a, a lot of those kinds of legislation, but we're seeing some other you know, um, legislation tax cuts have in, in several of the um, last few presidencies, we've seen tax cuts um, or tax measures, and they've been important over time. Um, certainly, the Biden administration right now is working on some very, very big uh, uh, and, and critical pieces of legislation that would probably fall into um, what might be reasonably thought of as, as um, very important um, uh, monumental legislation, the, the Build Back Better Act um, that, that the administration is working on. Um, I, getting back to the work on the authorizations though, I don't think that only the production of the most important pieces of the legislation are a good measure of Congress's output. Um, I've been a believer that we do need to do that sort of day-to-day -day lawmaking or governing of Congress. And um, Congress has not performed well on this. Those reauthorizations, I think, are, are central to that. And um, it has struggled more and more in the last 10 to 20 years in ensuring that there is an updating of those um, foundational laws, those laws that govern each of the, our major agencies. Are, um, and so we often are seeing that Congress is sort of kicking the can down the road, um, not able to renew or an update uh, how each of these agencies performs uh, uh, and, uh, and operates or they're not even really able to get off the ground, right? Immigration reform, for example. Um, and so they, that's the kind of issue that um, is screaming for Congress to address it 
but it's not able to get any traction because there's so little agreement. And it's not because of the other, other influences, of course, I'm speaking here of parties and, and the um, hyper-partisanship that we've seen, the, the, um, the tribalism sometimes referred to, the tribalism on Capitol Hill and the ability to, to find common ground, um, most, particularly, most particularly between the parties, but of course, even within the parties. And so it's not able to, to address a lot of these really critical um, uh, concerns of voters and the country. And so just is not even doing the, the, a lot of the sort of smaller things that need to get done. And to me, the reauthorizations was something that I was really focused on and its ability to renew and update legislation. And so um, I, I think that that's become a, um, a constant problem now. Uh, um, its performance as a body is really come into question. Um, and that's, I think, a lot of what reformers are thinking about today as well, is how do we reinvigorate the institution so that it can get back to that day-to-day -day governing that is that is really sort of what Congress is it is the 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 notion of a of a legislative body and what Congress is supposed to be doing all the time. It would seem from what you're implying on the on the reauthorizations and even on this kind of major legislation question that oh. it sounds to me like for the reauthorizations anyway, there is a general kind of consensus or at least a majority view on those reauthorizations that's not getting implemented into the Congress. Like there is a there's, there's a, a threshold level of, of desire to pass it, but there's not the action to do so. And that's kind of an institutional failing. Whereas for the major legislation piece, the, the question there is whether there is a solution that the majority yeah. would really support. To me, that sounds like two slightly different questions. One is more like Congress wants to do something but can't vote it for some reason. That's a failure. Uh, on the other side, it doesn't know what to do. So, you know, you can't vote it because you don't know what to do yet. Um, is that a fair kind of uh, view of what you mentioned? Well, okay. So, I, to some degree, yes. Um, uh, Thinking about the reauthorizations, um, there are certainly a number of um, lawmakers who would love to see just a, a, a radically smaller government and government doing far, far less. And the idea of not renewing or updating the legislation that um, allows these agencies and departments to perform um, they're, they're fine with just simply letting them expire. Um, and it, on that point, um, there is a group of lawmakers who in some ways, like me, believe that the reauthorization process is broken and would like to see it, um, uh, would like to see it reinvigorated, but with an, a slightly different aim, right? Whereas my, whereas the way I view it, um, it should be renewed so that we can update the legislation um, and and help these agencies perform to the needs, the current needs that there are for the 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 um, kinds of uh, uh, policy that they help to implement. There are other folks who just simply want to reinvigorate the reauthorization process so that they can just simply say, well, if we can't reauthorize it, why should it exist and eliminate the agencies? Now, I'm not a believer that that's a good way for, for government to operate. So there are folks who simply are standing in the way of renewing these agencies to eliminate them. Um, there are other reasons, as you were pointing out, um, uh, leadership doesn't want to um, 
always um, let go of its grip on the agenda and let the, this legislation move forward. Sometimes it's a, it's a fear of what might end up happening with that legislation and where it might land. Um, sometimes it's just simply a need to focus on other things. Um, the committees are no longer very well equipped to actually do the renewals, the reauthorizations. Um, there's an institutional memory that's been lost uh, because of the lack of working on the, this legislation. Um, so there are a whole bunch of factors that play into why reauthorizations are really seem to be um, um, dormant at the, at, at the moment. Um, and as you do point out, there is a difference between that and uh, a fundamental disagreement on um, how we should approach um, tuition and in, in, in higher education or support for our um, elementary and secondary education in schools or um, there, there, there are some really fundamental uh, differences in how the two parties approach some of these issues. And just, and when you have slim majorities like we've seen and like we're currently seeing, of course, um, in, in, in both the House and Senate, it is very hard to even get your, your small majority to agree on the details of legislation. And, and that's been playing out certainly in the last, um, in the last year. So yeah, the, there are differences in the dysfunction of the two. Um, yet I, it may very well be that underneath all of this is a, a core problem, which is uh, to, to some extent, uh, lawmakers are just simply not incentivized to spend a whole lot of time trying to work out those, those differences. They're incentivized to do a bunch of other things that really are just not lawmaking. Well, actually, that, that brings me to a question about some of your work related to um, incumbency and whether, whether there is accountability for incumbents. Uh, can you talk to that and the work you've done there? Yeah, um, right. So, I mean, uh, uh, in a lot of respects, um, this goes back to the questions about um, where, do, where do lawmakers come from? What are, what are their constituency motivations for what they do? And is that fundamentally different than it was a generation or two ago? And I, I think in a lot of ways, things have changed dramatically. Of course, we know that, um, that incumbents um, are much more likely to come from extremely partisan districts, right? Safe districts, districts that will only elect a lawmaker from their um, their party, uh, and 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 so we have fewer sort of battleground districts than we had, at least with respect to um, inter-party uh, uh, competition. But of course, what this has often meant is that lawmakers know that for the for the most part, they're fighting out. Um, their own reelection within their own party and, and just simply have to appeal to the folks who will show up in a primary. And um, more and more often that's becoming um, the more extreme ends of both political parties. Um, that doesn't mean that lawmakers can ignore the sort of economic or social or, or geographic aspects of their constituencies and, and lawmakers do lose um, re-election when they stop paying attention to that. And that becomes an opening for some. Um, but the dynamic in elections is different, is very different than it was um, a generation ago. And so while they still are paying attention to their constituencies and the things that they need to do to get re-elected, um, uh, in, in terms of ensuring that the economic well-being of their constituencies is being served, there's a there is a lot of other there are a lot of other aspects to that re-election calculus 
that are just far different. And raising money, spending all your time um, working on building a war chest um, is, is a major part of what we're seeing in a lot of for a lot of lawmakers, which means time away from lawmaking, time away from Capitol Hill per se, uh, and, and spending more of your effort uh, fundraising, getting on TV, um, using that as an avenue for building a constituency and building a re-election, um, uh, 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 a re-election machine. So, that has changed pretty radically. And lawmakers are not really necessarily, um, and I'm, I'm probably overgeneralizing a bit here, but they're, they're not necessarily talking only about um, how they can help their constituencies with making better public policy uh, to, to, to bolster the economic interests, the tourism, the agriculture, the auto industry, uh, those are still a focus for some lawmakers, but there are many, many now who are able to simply um, focus on the, on the social issues, the, the issues that get a lot of discussion on, on the um, nightly uh, political channels. And that is a avenue for reelection for those lawmakers. And they don't have to focus at all on what's going on in their constituencies. And all they have to worry about is winning that primary uh, because there's no realistic belief that they could lose to a, to a candidate of the other party. Well, actually this brings up a good segue into the, the questions that I ask all of our guests, if you're ready to move on to the next round. Sure. sure. Uh, the first question, you know, is directly related to what we just discussed, which is this concept of representation. You know, there's the concept of election, right? And then there's the concept of representation. These are two different things. Uh, so maybe you can talk about what do you think representation should really mean uh, for Congress? What does it really mean to an individual member or a senator? Yeah, I mean, what it should mean and where it is today are, are probably two different things, but I'll talk about what it should mean. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, while I, I very much am a believer that uh, lawmakers need to be very closely tied to their constituencies, they need to understand their consti constituencies, um, they, need, they, they need to be savvy, and most of them are very savvy in, in taking the pulse of what uh, voters at home think about particular issues. I don't think though that they should simply be a delegate to translating only what they hear from constituencies into votes in Congress. And they do need to be leaders. They do need to be um, explaining to their constituencies uh, the importance of doing, of pursuing policies that may not at first blush look like um, what the voters themselves would pick if they were given a list of, of um, policy options. But th there's a reason that these lawmakers are spending time in Washington talking with their colleagues, talking with policy experts, talking with um, the folks working in the agencies and the, the bureaucrats, because they need to get a sense of where policy should be going and what are the best choices for their constituencies and the, and the nation as a whole. So I, I think that that is critical to representation is leadership and helping their constituencies to understand why policy is going in a particular direction and may not be one that plays well at, at the meeting with constituents um, at home. And so they do need to be able to um, be in a position to help translate what's going on in Washington to what will benefit um, both their own constituents and the nation as a whole. So 
to me, representation is really, a, in a lot of ways, policy leadership. But it sounds like you're more of a Burkean than, than the delegate model. Yes. And, and uh, it also, you seem to be implying that a representative covers everybody in their district, not just their primary voters or yeah. those who voted for them. Uh, I think that's where, as I was alluding to a few minutes ago, I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble right. uh, when they're not understanding that there are there are other folks out there who didn't vote for you. Um, well, they understand. Let me just let me start that over again. They understand that there are folks out there who didn't vote for them, but they have different interests. But you do need to represent them. You do need to be paying attention to what their needs are. Um, and, and when they don't coincide with your supporters, um, you, it may be a tough choice, but, but sometimes it's important that they get the kind of representation um, that's critical to making the best public policy. Um, we're, we're seeing too few lawmakers who are willing to stick out their necks in that way. And even fewer thinking about, you know, the future generations. So I'm curious about your opinion as it relates, you know, representation. Does it just represent people who are alive today? Is it future generations? Is it kids? Is it grandkids? Is it 10 generations down? You know, what, if I'm a rep for Congress, if I, if I represent a district, what's my relationship to those future constituents? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So I, when I teach my introduction to American politics class, I talk about, I do the representation um, lecture, and I talk about representing various interests in your constituencies, right? And we, um, uh, Dick Fenno, of course, had a great um, book on this topic of showing the different constituencies, um, uh, of course, your geographic constituency, and then different types of voters and supporters, your primary voters, the, the ones who will vote for you in, in, um, in, a, in a general election. And of course, as we were talking about a lot previously, the different kinds of social and economic interests in your constituency. And then I say, but of course there are a bunch of other underrepresented constituencies, right? Folks who just never show up at the polls um, and they may come from particular um, economic, racial, religious, various kinds of other groups. Um, uh, um, and of course, people who can't vote for various reasons, no doubt young people, um, but other, other folks who are not, are, are disenfranchised or not engaged in the, in the political process, institutionalized folks. Um, they get underrepresented. And as you pointed out a moment ago, there's another, the future, right? Um, boy, it's very, very hard for the future to vote for you. Um, and so you're, you, the question is, do we ignore them because they're simply just not a, a, a winning constituency, a constituency that's likely to show up at the polls, but, but they're critical. And, and you know, I, I, I hope that that engages our students in thinking about these various kinds of constituencies that are really very, very important and should be part of our calculus when we're thinking about um, who is, is going to be, um, who's going to be impacted by the policies. But, but we need to consider um, the, the long-term effects of what these policies are, especially getting back to much of our earlier conversation, especially if we're questioning whether or not Congress is going to be able to revisit this legislation down the road. So how do we ensure that we're not just considering what's best today, but what might be best down the, for the future if we're in questioning whether or not Congress is gonna be able to update this? So yeah, it's a hard decision and, and one that while we do want to make sure that there's some staying power, there's some, there's some consideration of, of what's going on in the future, we also do need to think about um, how best to lay the groundwork to, to um, structure policy so that future Congresses can do what they need to, to um, update and, and help shape that legislation for what's happening at that time. 
But it sounds like you're implying that the current members do represent these future constituents absolutely. in addition yeah. to their, their living ones. Yeah, absolutely they do. Um, I, I think it's important that they think about that, but it's really hard to, to um, get a lawmaker who's worried about their next reelection to think about um, a generation or two down the road. Right. Right. Well, next question is, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? Are you a four day a week person, a two week on, one week off? You know, where do you come? You know, should they spend 100 percent of their time in D.C.? Where do you where do you fall in Congress's time allocation? Yeah, I'm I'm um, I am a believer that they do need to be together in Washington uh, on the Hill thinking about how they're they um, thinking about the legislation spending time in the committee rooms. Um, so I would try to have them there much longer than they are. Uh, um, I think we're, we're down to just about the bare minimum in terms of days working on policy. Now the, way, now, the thing is they're often in Washington but not necessarily working together on policy in, in the committee rooms, um, in their offices. Uh, and so I think that that to some degree is a, is a bit of a problem. Uh, I, I'm still heartened to see that they, they, when they get together, there is serious discussion on legislation. That's not to say they should be completely removed from their constituencies. I mean, they do need to be in touch um, talking to what voters are have to say, um, understanding what's going on in their districts. They can't be that far removed from it. Um, I would like to see uh, us um, being a little more relaxed about this notion of families moving to Washington. Um, uh, I think that that shouldn't be a black mark on lawmakers. But on the other hand, we also know that there are many, many two career um, families where one is a member of Congress and the other has a, has a career at home. And we need to be considerate of the fact that, that lawmakers do have to ha split their time, um, commute, so to speak, away from their families. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated uh, matter in trying to balance the two. I think there should be some flexibility. I think in the post COVID era, as we're all finding ourselves doing more work in this virtual space, that Congress, which has freed up a little bit of that, should consider whether or not we could perform some of our duties uh, some of the lawmakers' duties uh, in the virtual space a little bit more. That might allow for some flexibility. Um, it's not an easy thing. I don't think a lot of us have even figured out exactly how our own offices can, can do that kind of um, flexi flexible work. Uh, so Congress would certainly have its hands full trying to do that. But, but we're, we are seeing some of that and some acceptance of that. Uh, it also would give some opportunities for different kinds of people to be involved in terms of staff. Um, and, and, and we might be able to get um, the ability of, of individuals who have not normally been able to get engaged in the work of Congress to have a little more access to that. So, um, I am a believer that they do need to be engaged with one another in lawmaking uh, uh, a fair bit more than they are currently, um, but that could happen in, in a number of different ways. Next question is, uh, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? And I think you've already talked about the committees wanting to strengthen and have that, a lot of that debate happen there, but could yeah. you expand a little bit on where should this happen and should it be open or closed to the public? Yeah, um, I, I, as you mentioned, I'm certainly a big, uh, big believer in committees. I don't think anybody would mistake that. Um, and I, I do think that a, a lot of the most useful discussion it does occur 
when members are sitting there in their areas of expertise, and I think committees help to produce that expertise, um, they are able to um, uh, spend time together uh, uh, to, you know, working on, um, working on these issues with their staff, uh, bringing in bringing in experts outside experts, and I think that the most engaging conversations are happening. That deliberation is happening in the committee structure. So I would like to see much much more of that occurring. I do think that um, in general, this is there. There is some utility to having that conversation. Um, away from the, uh, the, the glare of, of um, the news cameras and the, so I, I would say that there is some utility in being able to work behind closed doors. I don't think it all has to occur behind closed doors. And of course we should be able to understand the motivations of lawmakers and maybe, you know, see how um, the sausage gets made, so to speak. But on the other hand, uh, many instances in which uh, um, members of Congress do need to be able to speak honestly and openly with one another and, and do this um, without fear that it's going to have sort of public consequences for them. Uh, and that doesn't allow them to make the compromises that are often required. Um, in general, though, I am a big believer that the best deliberation and the most productive deliberation um, should begin with the committee system itself and um, conversations in that sort of realm of specialization and expertise. Uh, uh, so I would, I would be a big advocate that we bolster that. Uh, bolster the the use of committees for for that discussion. Great. Well, next question. Uh, the next question is about uh, the fund. What fundamental improvement would you make to Congress within fifty year time frame? Oh, within a fifty year time frame. Um, uh, I, I I think you know I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record here, but. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest improvement in my mind is, is getting a committee system that works. Um, uh, and that is turning back to the committees, the duties and responsibilities of um, propelling most of the legislation forward. And so when there is an agenda item for a um, presidential administration or one of the parties wants to take up an issue that starting with the committee system and creating an expertise there. And I, I think that a lot of the current work being done on committees and in particular, um, bolstering the staff, um, the funding for staff, the support for staff, the professional development for staff, um, the career opportunities and the um, advancement for staff is all um, essential to making a committee system that will be um, that will be pivotal and will be the driving force of a reinvigorated and um, uh, a reinvigorated committee, committee uh, Congress vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch. And I think that's really very important. Um, too much has been um, handed over to the presidency because of its ability to be directed by a single individual and taking its cues from um, that agenda. And Congress has lost its place as this 
um, as this uh, conduit for the interests outside, the, the constituency interests, the business interests, the lobbying interests, who would normally get have an, a, a venue where they could have an influence on the governing, uh, on governing. And so I think that we need to have that opportunity and the committee system is probably the best place for that. And so we need to make this um, something that is, that we need to make committees a place where the conversation about legislation is happening and, um, and the expertise is built rather than just simply relying on leadership. So what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Okay, so I, I think if I were to have to go back to um, uh, where I started on all of this um, and thinking about representation and thinking about the work of, of lawmakers and the ties to their constituency, um, uh, David Mayhew's Congress the electoral connection has got to, got to be the the core of all of that. Um, it's a it's it, it is an amazingly simple and straightforward book. Um, it's it's a quick afternoon's read, which is astounding for such an influential book. Um, but I would say nothing drove my thinking, at least initially, when I was sort of gathering how the motivations of lawmakers more than than Mayhew's book uh, on on Congress. It was it was a seminal piece. I'm sure that others have probably said this pointed to the same book. Um, it it really was the go-to book. It was the one that I kept going back to and pulling quotes from uh, uh, I had the the pleasure of of uh, spending a year at Yale um, in the middle of my career, just down the hall from David Mayhew. Um, and it was just really a, an absolute pleasure to, to be able to stroll in his into his office and, and chat about whatever it was I was working on at the time. The man, of course, uh, no one knows Congress, no one understands um, the institution and what we have talked about within the 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 community of congressional scholars better than David Mayhew. So it was really just a, an honor to be able to, to talk with him. But I would say it's that book that probably was the initial book to shape my thinking about, about the institution more than any other book. Great, well, the last question is really about your plans. I mean, obviously you've got your uh, administration uh, responsibilities, but in terms of the research, in terms of Congress, what do you, what do you have in the works uh, for the future? Um, yeah, so been working a little bit on um, understanding the shape of federal policy and the place of committees within uh, shaping that policy. So we did a big data collection project, which I had started um, several years ago on um, uh, looking at the uh, United States code section by section. Um, recording how each of those sections was created, what legislation uh, contributed to the um, initial creation and or, and or amendment of that section, and then able to attribute that to committees and the work of committees. And so that has been sort of shaping my current thinking about um, the place of committees in the scope of the whole of federal policy. I have a paper that we're working on, um, uh, kind of a measurement of how much of the total totality of federal policy committees are, um, are influential. And, and so sort of a measure of committee influence. So, um, this sort of using this data set on, on the US code 
and how it's evolved over time. The ebb and flow of certain areas of the US code is sort of a big part of, of the work that I'm doing these days. And of course, you know, spending a lot of time thinking about the notion of graduate education in general um, and how we train our, our students and, and how we can do that better. So um, that's, that's a big part of what I do day to day. Right, well, Professor Adler, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Thanks for this conversation. It was really, really interesting. <laughs>